Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we are now going to a time and a place where there are no jeans, there are no clades, there are, <laughs> there are real places, there are real people. Um, I don't know about their hair because most of them wore wigs. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the men at any rate. The, um, and species uh, just meant kind of, of plant. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, and if, if you, when we get to some of the quotes, to, if, you can, if you can see them from the back, I won't bother to read them to save time. Uh, so thank you uh, f for coming, uh, and I thank the Linnean Society for great hospitality here and also at, in London. Uh, like many of the talks we've heard already, I'm reporting on an unexpected find in an unexpected place. The place is the little public library of Mount Holly, New Jersey, which is a small town, old but small. The library had once been known and is now again known as the Burlington County Lyceum of History and Natural Science. In 2006, while I was working on the Linnaean Tercentenary exhibition on Linnaeus and America at the American Swedish Historical Museum in Philadelphia, I happened to see a listserv reference um, to the Lyceum. And I thought, well, it might be worth stopping by to see what's there. Uh, I go, had to go between Princeton and Philadelphia often, and Mount Holly's roughly halfway between. And I thought maybe, well, maybe they'll have 19th century popular natural history books that might be interesting for the ex exhibition. Well, the scope of their collections is another story, uh, but I'll just note that the, um, when the Lyceum got its charter in 1862, uh, it had 150 local members, 100 corresponding members, and it had big ambitions. It planned to have seven curators and um, sta 11 standing com uh, committees, which you see here, uh, all the branches of natural history, plus history and numismatics and, and antiquities. When I visited Mount Holly, their wonderful director, Michael Eck, showed me the Lyceum's original collection of 100 or so books that I originally expected to look at up in the attic of this 19th century mansion. And he casually mentioned, oh, you might like to see this, uh, this brick of a book. Uh, when I looked at the title page, uh, I caught my breath. I was flabbergasted. Um, I knew of at least three other early English herbals um, that had made it to the Delaware River Valley region, that's to say the Philadelphia side and then the New Jersey side of the Delaware River. Uh, and then also Delaware, uh, I should add, throw that in as well, uh, in colonial times. But what was this inscription doing on the title page? Um, and there's the, so there's the inscription, and I'll make it a little more legible now. Um, Ex Bibliis J. Bannister in Virginia, 1688. Uh, Ex Libris, um, out of the library, from the library of J. Bannister in Virginia, 1688. So what was it doing on the title page? If it was indeed the signature of the late 17th century botanist, Virginia botanist, John Bannister, who lived from 1654 to 1692, how had his book reached the library of a smallish New Jersey town? So this huge herbal became yet another object for the exhibition. Now it was exemplifying pre-Linnaean botany in America. That was fine. Um, and I had a new research project, uh, which I've been playing with for, well, since 2006. Now, in the course of trying to answer these questions about the, the Parkinson herbal and its place in John Bannister's life, I've been looking not only at the, the text of the Parkinson um, herbal, but also at the 
book as a material object. Uh, so what do the marks of its user or users suggest about the way um, the book was read once it reached America? And what can we learn from this really singular artifact about how John Bannister went about being a botanist in a terrain that was wholly new to him? Now, I've, I've actually heard somebody at this meeting, um, Daniel Bryan, uh, say how how astonished he was coming from Texas to see the, the, the flora of the Arnold Arboretum and Boston uh, completely different from where he was. But Daniel has lots of tools for understanding that flora, not to mention a whole bunch of colleagues. Uh, John Bannister was in a completely different situation. Uh, so these questions are very much in line with these flourishing new, I, let me put quotes, new disciplines of um, historical disciplines of the material culture of the book uh, and cultures of collection. There's lots and lots of work being done in both these fields and they mesh. Um, but these in turn flow from the issues that collectors, naturalists, taxonomists, archivists, booksellers, librarians have grappled with for centuries about um, the sources and the reliability of their, um, their objects. Now in particular, as far as John Bannister and his, this book are concerned, uh, these questions, this research is really a footnote to an admirable biography of John Bannister by Joseph and Nesta Ewan um, published in 1970. And the more I look at this biography, the more I'm impressed. It was done before the internet. It represents an extraordinary amount of um, looking up of things, and um, I rely on it completely. Now, we've heard lots of wonderful tales of naturalists and their field work here. Um, the, the farthest back we've gone is Dave Elliott's lovely movie about Mark's, Mark Catesby. And that showed us Virginia and Catesby's patron, William Byrd II, uh, at the beginning of the 18th century when Catesby came to Virginia. We're gonna go now back a generation before Catesby, uh, but in the same neighborhood uh, of colonial Virginia and let me now introduce you to Reverend John Bannister. Well, no, that's not him, sorry. Uh, that's his boss. Uh, in 1678, 24-year-old uh, Reverend John Bannister went to Virginia. He, he came in two capacities. He was an, um, a qualified Anglican minister. He was going to be a missionary to the, the colonists. But he was also a, a committed naturalist. Uh, his, his superior, the guy who sent him there, was Henry Compton, Bishop of London, whom we've met. And thank you, Mark Spencer, for the loan of this slide. Um, this wonderful port uh, uh, portrait by uh, Godfrey Neller. And uh, we've already heard how Bishop Henry Compton was probably more interested in the trees in his garden at Fulham than he was in theology. Um, so Compton was absolutely delighted to have somebody after his own heart go be a missionary in Virginia. He, Compton was in charge of the missionary activities of the Anglican Church. Bannister found a um, congenial patron in Virginia in the person of C Colonel William Byrd I, that's the father of Catesby, Virginia patron. Keeping track of the William Byrds is a real pain in the neck, but uh, I, I'll try to keep reminding you who's who. Now, as often as Bannister could, he sent back to England uh, seeds, herbarium specimens, press plants, drawings, descriptions of American plants. Uh, to Bishop, Con uh, Bishop Henry, to uh, John Ray, to Plukinet, his own, to his own mentor at Oxford, Robert Morrison, and others. Uh, despite the fact that Bannister arrived in Virginia in the midst of uh, a time of conflict, uh, barbarous enemies, to use his term, 
threatened both local neighbor Indians, friendly Indians, and European settlers. It seems pretty clear that Bannister was not deterred um, he, and began collecting practically from the moment he arrived in Virginia. By the time he wrote his first letter a year later to Robert Morrison in Oxford, um, he was reporting on the ra range of useful native plants and others whose affinity he just had to guess at. Um, and he makes a, very inter a couple of very interesting comments in his letter to Morrison. This country brings forth a multitude of vegetables, many of them unknown to me. I've met with a great number of trees, shrubs, and herbs that I know not what to make of for want of books and other helps and assistances pertinent to him that undertakes and intends such a work. Um, and you can see that he's already planning big explorations or thinking about them, hoping for them. Uh, and contemplating a full-length natural history of Virginia, but he was very conscious of the want of books. So let's go back to the book. What role did the Parkinson herbal play in the Bannister, Bannister's natural history activity? And we're going to take a closer look, well, first at the, the title page signature again. Um, it's, ex biblius is a really odd way of saying, um, you know, it's not, I've never seen it before, except in some of other Bannister, one other, I think, of Bannister's uh, books, play, signatures. Um, it's an unusual way of saying ex libris from the library of. I think of it as a mild clerical joke. It shows off Bannister's classical education, that's the Greek form of, of books, uh, and by capitalizing Biblis, he might be invoking at the same time the Bible as well as uh, other books. And you notice that the inscription falls nicely between the engraved figures of Adam and on the right, which you can't see in this one, uh, Solomon, the two naturalists, practicing naturalists in the Bible. Uh, Bannister specifies that the book is in his library in Virginia in 1688. But the date shows that he, the book reached him nearly half a century after the publication of the book in 1640 and a full decade after he himself came to Virginia. So how did the book come to him? Uh, I'm going to leave that question dangling for a bit. Uh, let's look a little closer into the book, um, and we will see that there are manuscript annotations in Bannister's hand. Most of the ones, I'm not going to show them to you, most of them are, he just goes very carefully numbering all the different kinds, the different species um, that Parkinson lists or describes um, for a given genus, um, but and there's some corrections and typos and occasionally a comment. But at the very last page um, are some very interesting things. Parkinson has a very quick list of plants from the habitations of our own peoples in Virginia, the Bermudas, and New England. And Bannister adds some corrections or additions uh, to the list. The very first one up at the top, um, which he, he does it so neatly, it's easy to miss. Um, and uh, here is, yes, okay, way up at the top is uh, the poisoned weed, says Parkinson. Uh, it's like our English ivy. And uh, Bannister adds hetera trifolia. Um, now, that is poison ivy. If you don't know what a poison ivy rash looks like, look at me. Um, I'm really embarrassed to say that I have it. You know, my face is covered with poison ivy. I do know what it looks like, and I'm embarrassed to have caught it. But at least it's an object lesson in what they were worried about, and quite rightly. Uh, the next one is, um, oh, and here's Mark Spencer's uh, slide again of Virginia creeper. Bannister knew the difference between poison ivy and Virginia creeper. Um, and the, you know, the, in the field, the most obvious thing is that poison ivy has three le leaves of three, and, poison, and Virginia creeper has leaves of five um, and is not poisonous. And when Mark gave, showed this, he was, he was pointing to the reference to Catesby in these um, herbarium sheets. Uh, but 
the, the clipping from Pettifer also um, points to Bannister and Plukinet's use of Bannister's illustrations. Okay, one other uh, very interesting uh, annotation shows that Bannister knew enough about the native language and medicine healing practices to correct uh, Parkinson on the meaning of the uh, probably Algonquin, but I don't ask me, uh, word uh, wosakan. Uh, Parkinson, says, Parkinson says, with the roots, they cure their hurts and disease. And the, by there, he means the Native Americans. Uh, in Virginia, Bannister corrects this to say that wosakan uh, doesn't mean a particular root. It means any kind of uh, physic, and hence they call drams uh, rum or brandy wosakan uh, because it makes them sick. <laughs> uh, the, this word, by the way, has a, long, a, a much longer history in the history of natural history of Virginia and Roanoke. Uh, it goes back to Thomas Harriet and John White and John Gerard, a century before Bannister. Also in the herbal, there are pressed plants. Uh, this is polyrhizos, the rattlesnake weed of Virginia, uh, which Parkinson declares a soft, here's a closer look. And Parkinson declares it so certain a remedy against the biting of that venomous rattlesnake, as they call it in Virginia, which, breed, which breatheth in Virginia. I think it to be preferred before any of the four remembered most sovereign plants against poisons. Um, and then he deals with the names, and you can see he's just throwing up, oops, sorry, he's throwing up his hands what name to call it, uh, a reminder of nomenclature chaos before Linnaeus and what Linnaeus had to do to figure it out. Uh, finally, there are some beautiful, uh, Bannister made beautiful drawings, and um, he was taught these by Reverend John Clayton, who was sometime between, in his first few years in Virginia. This is not the Clayton whose work was ripped off or immortalized by Linnaeus and Grenovius. Um, Clayton says in a letter to Robert Boyle that I put Bannister upon drawing the cuts of some plants and gave him instruction therein and he had perfected some few before I left the country. Uh, poor Clayton, that was a naturalist, but, and obviously interested in this stuff, but he, shades of Wallace and many others, lost all my books and chemical instruments and glasses and microscopes at sea on the way home. Now, just after, shortly after Clayton left Virginia, William Byrd I, the patron of Bannister, Went to, uh, went to England on business in 1687, 1688, and made a point of buying book, both books and drawing materials for Bannister. Uh, so there, here come some of the tools that he wanted. Uh, Bird brought back a copy of Ray's, John Ray's Historia Plantarum, uh, volume two, which was hot off the press. It was a gift of Plukinet to uh, Bannister, and it had a gratifying three-page catalog of new plants. Uh, so, let me go back. Sorry, I lost my picture of this. But if I find it again, we'll, I'll show it to you. At any rate, there's a catalog of Bannister's plants, uh, which is headed, catalog of plants transmitted by, uh, composed by that most consummate botanist, most excellent man, Dr. Bannister, uh, and observed by himself in Virginia. And now the, his drawings, um, this one on the right is the Aristolochia, the rattlesnake root uh, <coughs> that was portrayed, uh, illustrated by Parkinson in some form, and the plants pressed in the book uh, represent, I believe, um, uh, the same plant. Uh, 
The trouble with pressed plants in a book, of course, is you don't know who put them there. You don't know who put them and when they were put there. All you can hope is that in this case, because there are annotations by Bannister on the opposite page, the plants match the, uh, the dis description of ba Parkinson, and we know that Bannister was interested in the plant, and all his buddies back in England were very interested in the plant, that we hope that it was Bannister who put them in there, but we can't be sure. And you can see the, up at the top that uh, Plukinet is ascribing um, a description of the plant, and there's a picture by, uh, that Plukinet has taken from Bannister um, of the Virginian snake root. And, oh yes, and, and in the second uh, snippet, uh, Mr. Bannister is also describing it, and it's re uh, he refers it to Parkins Theatrum Botanica. So he's obvious Bannister's work is consulting the, the uh, Parkinson herbal is uh, being recognized in England. Uh, now, so that answers a question that, you know, it's reasonable to ask. Was the herbal half a century old any use to Bannister um, in Virginia? And I think so. I mean, here's one piece of evidence. But there's a bit more to it. Um, he undoubtedly used it as a student at Oxford, working in Morrison's garden and with Morrison's herbarium, his own herbarium there. So he knew his way around this enormous book, and that's an enormous, a big advantage if you're if you've got one re reference book. It helps to know how to use it. Um, it gave it was illustrated, which aided comparisons, as we see here. Um, it gave him a model for his own illustrations and for his descriptions, and it had, at that point, the largest number of American plants uh, described in print, uh, thanks to Parkinson's friendship with the uh, Tradeskins and other American sailors and travelers. And just as Linnaeus found Plukinet's copies of Bannister's drawings uh, in Plukinet's Phytographia invaluable, uh, working on with the Flora Virginica uh, and later in Species Plantarum, we see again a chain of usefulness um, of the ultimately going back to the herbal. But we don't really have to surmise that uh, Manister find the book useful. Um, here we see it in his own words. Uh, he, compi he was compiling a big plant catalog, uh, started as soon as he got to Virginia. Most of the descriptions are in Latin, 400 plants roughly, um, and Parkinson is cited more often than any other author, uh, 38 times in this collection of four um, plants. Now I've left you in suspense. Um, I should say this manuscript finds its way into Sloan's papers, uh, no surprise. What happened to Bannister? What happened to his books, his plants, his papers, his drawings? How did the Parkinson herbal get to Mount Holly? Bannister died in 1692 in an accidental shooting out in the Virginian backwoods with, while he was traveling with Bird and some others. The shooter, um, uh, just an ordinary guy, was acquitted of any wrongdoing. Bannister left a widow, a young son, also named John Bannister, just to add to confusion. Um, who later became the manager of the Byrd estate at Westover under William Byrd II. Um, as a small boy, William Byrd II had almost certainly known Bannister before being sent off to England for an education. And it's sort of pleasant to think that Byrd II's own interest in natural history, he became a fellow of the Royal Society at a young age, um, and his patronage of Mark Catesby uh, a few decades later, was inspired by that early acquaintance with Bannister. After Bannister's death, oh, here, I'm sorry, here's the uh, catalog of plants as described by John Ray. After Bannister's death, uh, Edward Randolph of Jamestown tried to continue collecting and sending specimens back to England, but he wrote sadly, since the chief florist being dead, 
There is no man here understands the many hundreds plants growing here different from those in England. Bannister's papers, specimens and drawings were sent back to Bishop Compton as his boss where they were exploited by the London botanists and uh, ultimately found their way into Sloan's collections. Bannister is cited uh, fairly often by Linnaeus and directly and many times indirectly through uh, Linnaeus's use of these London botanists who relied on Bannister. Um, and Mark Catesby, as we saw earlier, also um, collected this plant, and he calls it the, um, the St. Crude of Virginia. And I, he adds a very interesting note. Uh, the usual price of this excellent root both in Virginia and Carolina, is about six pence a pound when dried, which is money hardly earned, which means earned with difficulty. Yet the Negro slaves, who, only, who are the only ones who dig it, employ much of the little time allowed them by their masters in search of it, which is the cause of their being seldom found any but very small plants. Um, so we've got ecology, we've got economics, um, and the true Virginian snake root. Bannister's books, including the Parkinson Herbal, were absorbed into the library of William Byrd II, Catesby's patron. The lar that was the largest library, certainly in the southern colonies. Um, his William Byrd's son, William Byrd III, went bankrupt. His widow sold this huge collection of books to a Philadelphia bookseller. Uh, and in the late 18th century, there were several auctions of these books. Uh, and the Bird Library, and with it the Bannister Library was dispersed. Many books remained in Philadelphia, and I've been able to find some of them. Uh, the Parkinson Herbal was listed in the manuscript auction catalog, which was edited uh, by two very learned people, especially Kevin Hayes, but neither of them knew where this book was. It dropped out of historian's sight for about two centuries, except for a brief, incomplete, error-ridden sighting reported in the William Marriott Quarterly in the early 20th century. But much of the time since the auction in the late 18th century, it's been sitting quietly in the Burlington County Lyceum of History and Natural Sciences. A local doctor, Alexander Elwell, um, MD, a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, had donated it. Yes. Um, had donated to the Lyceum in 1859, uh, before the thing was uh, chartered, and that's where I found it in 2006. Um, Robin just said, you know, it's important to ask, so what? Um, I think the so what's of this are to remember how much luck plays in the success of a botanist or a naturalist, uh, how important <coughs> books are as a tool, still, still, um, and good eyes, uh, good hands, they're just not enough. Um, you need help figuring out what these plants are. And for a plant, any, I would say any plant identified as coming from Virginia in this early, uh, this period of the late 17th and early 18th century, um, tracking down the true source of that specimen could be quite difficult. Um, and it might be Bannister that cho uh, picked it, even though he might not be named. And finally, I would use this as an argument um, for gun control. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>